Well, welcome tonight. Uh, this is an informal celebration of Dell Bland uh, that's being uh, co-sponsored by EAC and the ANS. Um, the original idea for doing this was uh, Uta Wartenberg Kagan, and uh, she had suggested that we do it in New York either before April or after, after October at a time when it was affordable to stay in New York. And I said to her over the phone, I said, well, you know, if we do it in Dayton the first week in May, everybody that's interested is already going to be there. And uh, nobody has to make any different travel plans. She thought that was a great idea. And so we are here. And, uh, and uh, there is food. There is uh, libation. There are libations. And you're welcome to partake. Larry and Gary, where are you? Not here yet. Yes, Larry and Larry and Gary Bland over there, and they may want to say a few words at some point. Again, this is informal. We're not. Nobody's required to say anything wonderful or, or awful. Uh, we won't say anything bad about Dell anyway. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, Dennis Loring will talk. But right now, I want to turn it over to David Hill from the ANS. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill. Yeah, we are uh, so enormously pleased to be here from the ANS. I'm here, um, David Hill, I'm the librarian at the ANS, and I'm here with Gilles Bronsborg, the uh, deputy director. And I'm glad to see that uh, everybody, I mean, such an enthusiastic crowd, and I see that everybody seems to have found a seat. So I think I'm ready to just get started. Uh, we had, Now, we wanted to as I say, we're thrilled to be here at the EAC, uh, and, but we're also particularly thrilled to have this opportunity to honor Del Bland, who passed away last year at the age of 84. Because Del made, made such an enormous contribution to large scent, uh, the knowledge about large scents generally, but also to uh, the ANS's own understanding of its collection. Now, I never met Del Bland in person, but I did talk to him on the phone a few times. He did call me um, within the last, I'd say, six years or so. I know he was doing research actively. In some of his records, I've seen that he was doing research as late as 2013, so I don't know if, how long he kept doing this, but um, I did talk to him a few times. He would call looking for information. But what we do have is this handwritten uh, autobiography, basically, that he wrote in 2007. We have this on file. And this is where I learned uh, most of what I know about Del, Del Bland, that he uh, grew up in Texas, and he says that he grew up surrounded by alligators and water moccasins. Uh, he said that his father was a trapper and a log cutter, and that his mother was a teacher. Interestingly, he said he barely had worn shoes until he was about 11 years old, he says, and um, that's when he moved with his mother to the state of Washington. Uh, he played basketball, unsurprisingly, and football, but he also loved to golf and fish. He was also a stamp collector. And also, of course, he got involved in coins at a very young age, uh, supporting his hobbies with paper routes and lawn mowing jobs. As an adult, he also held all kinds of jobs, he says here in this autobiography. He was a computer programmer and also a car salesman. But in 1969, he became a full-time coin dealer speciali specializing in uh, early US cents. Dell got interested in large sense in the 1950s, building and selling his collections. He says that at one point he assembled one of the finest collections of 1794 cents by variety. And then he sold it to buy a home in Washington that he moved into with his wife, Nancy, in 1980. Dell began seriously studying early US copper coins in 1973. And decades later, his detailed research would be a major part of Walter Breen's Encyclopedia of Early United States Cents published in 2000. Now his contribution was a major contribution. I mean, it takes up, from my uh, understanding of it, a just enormous portion of the book, perhaps the majority. And it was this con uh, condition census. And um, this is where he listed the finest known specimens with their pedigrees. He examined and graded most of the coins listed. And for years, he was assisted by a researcher named Jeff Peck. It was a major undertaking, as I said. There were 4,000 coins and more than 25,000 individual entries. And it was this research that brought Dell to the ANS in 1988. And as you can see, this condition census in this particular example runs on to, you know, over uh, a single page into the next page. Now, the ANS has been acquiring large cents almost from the beginning, when it uh, began in 1858. 
after all, it was the change from the larger to the smaller cent that really spurred the, and is credited for the sudden interest in coins in the 1850s generally, and which led, to, for example, to the founding of the ANS directly in 1858, this kind of general interest in coins that started in the 1850s and kind of enormously grew then in the, in the decades after that. ANS co-founder Edward Groh gave about 20 of these cents in 1859, and uh, Isaac Wood gave about 50 more of them uh, about uh, a few years later. But by the end of the century, it was obvious that the society had real deficiencies in this area, and there were calls for a coordinated effort to improve the collection. Frequent donor Sanford Saltis, J. Sanford Saltis, donated some specimens, including a few proof and uncirculated examples, but it really wasn't until about a half a century later in 1946 when George Clapp gave his superb collection of over 1,500 cents, that the ANS came to have a world-class collection. Now, as uh, most of you probably know, George Clapp may, of Pittsburgh made his money in the aluminum industry. He had begun collecting coins as a boy in the 1870s, and in retirement devoted himself to large cents. He collected other things too, including uh, over 100,000 mollusk shells, and these and other collections he gave to the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh and the best of the large cents came to the ANS. Now, I'm not going to dwell on the next chapter here in the ANS large cents story. I mean, this was covered uh, earlier today in another session, uh, John Kleberg's excellent um, talk that he gave. Uh, but I will say that this is where Del Bland made such an essential contribution to the ANS. As ANS fellow and curator John Kleberg has said, it was Bland's rare abilities as a grader that were so valuable in getting to the bottom of what had happened. Dell issued his findings in a 1990 report, identifying coins that had been switched out based on much of his conclusions, basing the, his conclusions on his consensus, on his uh, condition analysis. Okay, so these, in the 1970s, there were concerns about the ANS's and uh, large cent collection and the way they were being handled. So the society began to limit access, as uh, many of you saw earlier today when uh, John Kleberg's uh, segment on this, um, they begin to limiting access to the, to the coins themselves and making these photocopies of this uh, inventory available. But I'm happy to say that these notebooks have now been scanned by the Newman Numismatic Portal and are now available on Internet Archive. So as many of you know, for a few years now, we have been operating a scanning satellite of the Newman Portal at the ANS where items are currently being scanned by Laura Jacobs. So far, about 7,000 items from the ANS Library and Archives are available online. So if you go to Internet Archive, you can page through the CLAP coin inventory and click through its pages. So while I have the opportunity here and I have a captive audience, I'm going to highlight just a few other things that we have on the Newman portal that relate to large cents. For, also there you can find the draft of the inventory that was done by the curators. Uh, Henry Grunthal and Richard Doty and other uh, ANS curators uh, before they completed the other one with the images that were offered for sale as photocopies. We also have the notebooks of Worthington Bittler documenting his collection on large cents that he put together in 1945 to 1960. Uh, with clippings, personal notes, and plates cut, cut from auction catalogs. So these are all available uh, online on the Internet Archive and through the Newman portal. We also have Joseph Levick's uh, Book of Rubbings. Levick helped relaunch the ANS after the Civil War. He was a collector of tokens, as well as 1793 cents, famously publishing a photographic plate of them in his American Journal of Numismatic, in, in the American Numis Journal of Numismatics in 1869. His rubbing book has images and notes of the coins, and um, you can see if you go to the Newman portal, you can, or the Internet Archive, you can page through this. It's also quite fragile, so this is a really great example of something we're doing to help preserve uh, the items by placing them online and keeping the handling to a minimum. We also have another set of notebooks available. These are those of uh, Edward Groh, who was a co-founder of the ANS. They mostly document tokens, but Groh did depict and list all kinds of numismatic items, including what might have been his own collection of large cents. And finally, I'll mention this first edition of S.H. Chapman's book on 1794 cents. 
which was published in 1923. These are rare to begin with, according to Jim Nicewinner, who is with us today. Uh, there were only about 10 or so copies of this version known. And this one is particularly special because it belonged to Clapp, who annotated it with the sometimes humorous comments about Chapman's notoriously error-filled work. And so you can see here that he points out factual errors, but also comments on Chapman's uh, spelling and grammar also. Like when Chapman criticizes the work of Edward Frassard, Clapp says, bonk, it is understandable, and Frassard knew how to write English. Uh, Jim talks about this in his book About Sense, uh, which he published, his second book, I think, in 2017. But getting back to Del Bland, I mean, this great picture here. A few years ago, as Del was preparing to sell much of his library, bookseller David Fanning, also with us today, uh, visited him at his home to discuss the collection. David was struck by the immensity and importance of the research archive that Dell had been compiling for decades. And Dell knew how important it was, too, saying that he would love to see these materials end up at the ANS. And so David, who was a fellow at the ANS, set about finding donors to acquire the materials. And we're pleased and grateful for his success, and I would like to thank the donors who made this acquisition possible. Longtime benefactor John Adams, as well as Robert Rodriguez. Dan Hamelberg, Bill Bird, and Joel Oros. And so here's uh, Dell's archive as it arrived a few months before he died uh, to the ANS. It came in 22 boxes containing nearly 300 ring binders. Put on a shelf, they would run for about 40 feet. The ANS has always been eager to make this material available, but there were concerns about privacy since current scent owners are sometimes named in the records. And they may not want this advertised to other dealers and collectors. And so we have given owners a chance to contact us regarding particular coins so that we can honor their privacy requests. So far, no one has contacted us. And so of April 1st, the materials have been available for research. So these materials are available for, for research. But keep in mind that, the, that people can step forward at any time and request that their ownership of particular coins be kept private. The ANS Board of Trustees also implemented a firm no photography rule concerning the materials, meaning that they will not be scanned for inclusion on the Newman portal or Internet Archive. Also, researchers must use the materials in person, and there will be no copying of any kind by phone or otherwise. The ANS members have free access to the materials, and non-members must pay the usual library fee of $20 per day to use the materials. And so, to conclude, I really just want to say that we're thrilled again to be here to be, and that this part of Dell's legacy has found its place at the ANS. And I invite interested researchers and people that can come and look at the materials, and they are now available. Um, and it's <coughs> available for research. So thank you. some questions. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? <clears throat> yeah. So the archives of the collection, mm -hmm. were they of Claps collection, are those just the ANS items or are they all of Claps coins that you have catalog? Those are the ANS collection. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was the point of those being created. Yeah. Right. And I, I, for the second time, I was watching the Kleberg um, talk today and he talked about how they would um, show people this inventory, and then they would bring them one coin. You, would, you could say, I, I'd like to see this coin, and they would bring you one coin. I guess that's how it worked. Are you aware of whether the collection that's at the Carnegie in Pittsburgh is cataloged anywhere or hmm. uh, recorded in any way? I'm not aware. What was the question? Whether the Pittsburgh coins are... Pittsburgh coins? Yeah. Or are they the catalog? Rest, or are they the 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 whether there's a catalog of them anywhere. Oh. I couldn't hear that. I'm so sorry. I don't know. Let me, let me mm -hmm. speak to that. Yeah, sure. I, I have a question. Okay. Wait, let me, I mean, let me, let me just comment on that first. I believe, uh, it's not definite yet, but I believe that there will be some access to those coins at our convention next year in Pittsburgh. I'm working on it. Yes, I know you are. <laughs> Chuck. Chuck Heck. It's not a question, it's more of a comment probably know from reading a silly thing on Region 8, 
but Jim and I have been up to the ANS many times, and this man, David Hill, has provided so much support in research, and the ANS now has the Del Bland binders <coughs> available to anybody. You heard what he said, to anybody. If you're a member, it's for free. If you're not a member, what'd you say? You pay $25 for a day? 20. 20. $20 for a day. Mm -hmm. I think we have to applaud the ANS for what they are doing. A Dell charged us nothing whenever we had a question. And I thank the ANS for buying these binders. Thank you, David. To our donors. Thank you. Dennis, Dennis Loring, you're here somewhere. Here he comes. I'm very lucky. I had the pleasure of knowing Dale for nearly 50 years. And we did a lot of stuff together. Just want to give you a little bit of the flavor of the man. <clears throat> he was a prodigious eater. <laughs> this is a man whose idea of a great meal was a two-pound steak and a quart of ice cream. <laughs> Let you, lest you think I'm kidding, I've seen him do it more than once. And he also played master's level, world-class basketball. Um, it is a minor miracle that he stayed around as long as he did, because if you put him behind the wheel of a car, the car morphed into a low-flying plane. <laughs> um, Del and I, as I said, did a lot of work together. And he obviously liked to work in the middle of the afternoon from the West Coast, which three hours later is the middle of dinner on the East Coast. And Del had an uncanny knack of knowing when Don and I were having dinner, because he always called during dinner. And our dinners were not three hours long. And it got to the point where even now, if the phone rings in the middle of the meal, we look at each other and say, Dell? <laughs> <laughs> Again, to give you an idea of, of the man and the work he did, there's a book out here, Eric Newman's biography, Truth Teller. You could have written exactly the same biography of Del Bland. This is a typical Del Bland letter. This one has nine questions. Where did you get the VF30S 244? Where did that VF30 244? Where did you get this fine 12? Which EF45 appeared in this sale? And then you get down to the detail. I'm only going to read you a paragraph so you can get a sense of how intensely this man worked. I'm having a problem with Sheldon 253. Maybe you know something. I have two pedigrees for the single example out of the Morgenthau July 39 sale. The Gaskell inventory says he bought the coin according to Sheldon, and I expect this is correct. But then the Clap ANS coin is also pedigreed to the same sale because of the July 31 inventory. Something else, the Clap ANS coin is on the 1925 Newman pl Newcomb plate, though listed as now belonging to Clap. To top it all off, Sheldon called the Glasgow 253 a 45 coin, and I show it going to Bob Vale as a 55. Notice how many names, books, he has invoked on this, tracing down this one coin. I'm going to get hold of Bob coin and recheck re it. Help, capital letters. <laughs> Maybe seeing the ANS piece will help straighten this out. If I could get rid of a cold, I'd be over this stuff that has plagued me for the last month. Of course, that's not enough to stop him from asking 12, 10 more questions. And I finally caught an idea. The right thing to do is to Xerox his letter, annotate it with whatever answers I could combine, and send it back to him. <coughs> and he was, he was so kind and considerate, he started this letter. I know you've missed my letters inquiring about pedigrees of sense you bought, so I thought I'd send you a list which you can bring to ANA. And he had eight more on that one. <laughs> he was indefatigable. indefatigable. He was dedicated. He was thorough. He was honest to a fault. He was a truth teller in the greatest sense of the world. 
He was also six foot five, and he was a hell of a guy in all ways. And again, I am privileged to have known him for as long as I did. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Thank you. Gary, Larry, want to say anything? Sure. I don't think you have to defend him at this point. <laughs> you may have you may have to raise the microphone. Uh, we tried to uh, we tried to put some uh, some notes together, my brother, and uh, I on the on the way here. Um, not we didn't really prepare anything. I, I mean, first and foremost, I think on our behalf and our family's behalf. We'd like to thank you know the EAC, the ANS, and everybody that has, and everybody in the room, quite frankly, and all the the, the people over the years that we met um, as as part of his his life. Um, we could, just so many personalities. You were talking to everyone from Bill Raymond and Chuck Virjanic and, and and Jack Bamer. These are all personalities we met over the years. Um, Some. May or may not know. You know, my parents are separated. Our parents are separated at uh, Adele. My my mom are separated. I guess seven or eight years old. We went to the East Coast. My father stayed in the West Coast. And but what we did every every year, we saw him obviously a number of times during the year. But every summer we went out to the West Coast. He basically picked us up at the airport, and we traveled around the country in in you know a car basically chasing coins, chasing books, <laughs> chasing different. You know, hob you know, things, hobbies, all, all sorts of things. So we did that for basically for three months. Slept in a car, which we loved to do. We were 10, 11 years old. It was great. And that kind of went on through the, uh, up and through the, I guess at that point, up in the mid-late 70s. And then he started, at that point in time, he started his research, which, because <laughs> David had touched on. And that summer trip suddenly became, we had a U-Haul attached to us. <laughs> so we basically... Then went to all cities around the country. We'd be in Dallas, we'd be up in Seattle, we'd be out in Texas, just filling up this U-Haul. And then we'd bring it all the way back at the end of the summer. We'd take it back at the end of, uh, back to Seattle, Seattle area. And obviously it was great. We enjoyed it. We loved it. Didn't really think a whole lot of it until you go back to New York City area and to explain to your friends what your summers were like, and they just think you're kind of nuts. But <laughs> anyway, that was uh, that was kind of our, our youth with our father. It was great. We weren't, I guess the three of us didn't really, um, you know, certainly didn't get to the depth. We had our own lives going on, which he was involved in. So we, we, we played a lot of basketball with him over the years as he got later, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then the next leg of it was, you know, I started to get a little bit involved in coins in, in 2000, and, and I just got married at that point in time to a lovely woman, Italian woman from Long Island, who's a very special breed if you have never met one. But um, <laughs> she, uh, when I first came back in the Philadelphia a a with my brother Gary, we, I bought, I don't know, three, three or four large cents for, I think it was maybe $10,000, and she, she would just, was what are you doing? We had just bought a house. It's like, uh, and that was only the beginning, we, you know, kind of aggregated from there. And every time I bought a coin, she was just, just kind of cursing me up and down. And I, my, and my father explained to me, this is how it goes. This is part of the process. <laughs> you know, that's why I had a number of wives. And that's what he talked about. I see, he has to say to me, he said, there's other women out there in case you want to move on to new coins. So, <laughs> I was like, oh, all right. But anyway, that was uh, obviously it was great fun. Um, you know, it really was. It was a pleasure. It, it, it helped me understand a little bit more about his coins. Every time we talked about a coin next auction, we're going to buy this coin, and I'd be like, "Well, we don't want to spend more than this money. This amount of money." He'd come back and say, "Well, we bought, we spent a little more than you asked for, but guess what? We bought two coins." So um, anyway, this is this is how it kind of played out over, you know, up and through the more recent years. Um, but it was it was truly a uh, a pleasure, a great life to be a part of, great person, and uh, again, thank you everyone. I don't know if Gary you want to say anything, but thank you everyone for for uh, everything you've done for him. Thank you for but, coming.
Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Gary Bland. I'm the, the middle child. I have an older brother, Stephen. Larry's the youngest. And, um, you know, the only thing I can do, I really want to thank everybody as well. I mean, it's very nice of you to, to, um, to, to put this on for my dad um, and uh, David and, and Dave Fanning and, and A&S and everybody who's, who's especially, I, I know in the past few months before he passed away, um, was very concerned about getting those that research at the ANS, and so I'm really happy that 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 was accomplished, and that uh, I know I know people contributed money to be able to pay uh, to cover the cost of that. So uh, thank you very much, and we really appreciate it. In terms of reminiscing, um, yeah, I mean you know being Del Bland's son, uh, like my brother was explaining, you kind of grow up knowing what a 1794 was. <laughs> you, you you get 1790 or not actually 1794s because they're too expensive, but any kind of large send for a birthday present, for a Christmas present. So we had decent, you know, collections of large cents by the time we were 15 years old, and um, I still have them. They're not very, you know, they're not 1794s or top varieties and so on and so forth, but. Yeah, we were on the picture of what one A and A in the '70s. The three, my three of us, were on the uh, front page of Coin World, for example. And then um, we, you know, meeting Walter Breen and Jack Famer and Gordon Rubel and all these big names in the business over the years. We haven't really been in touch with them so much lately, but um, that's kind of the childhood you get when you, you, you know, Del Bland is your dad. And he, um, as my my brother was also saying, at one point. It moved from, and I think was explained earlier, moved from uh, collecting the, the top, the, all the varieties, uh, the highest, best varieties of 1794s, which he sold that collection and then started doing catalogs. And we were shipping catalogs. We, I spent one summer, we shipped catalogs on top of a rental car on the roof all the way across the country. Um, I can remember in the 70s just being in, in the house going through catalogs of coins, trying to find, I, I guess, doing his research. That's when it all started. And then, um, and then even just a year ago, uh, you know, uh, he, we were going through his garage. He had to find a particular, uh, like Dennis was saying, he was, so, he was so precise and so passionate about getting the information correct. We had to find this particular sale, a particular coin, in a particular catalog, and his eyesight wasn't very good, so I had to be his eyes. We went through the garage, we went through probably 15, 20 boxes of catalogs. And we never found it, actually. But that's the kind of thing he wanted to do. And, you know, a few years ago, I live in Washington, and he called me up. He said, can you go to the Library of Congress and check on this particular person who owned this particular coin and see if, uh, if he lived in this particular town and what his name was? So the only thing they had wrong was the middle initial. So the middle initial was wrong. But he was so excited that I got that correct. And he thanked me for it. So it gives you kind of an idea of, 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 of the nature. I mean, he must, he really had a passion for this, he, clearly. So uh, um, the research was very important to him. And he spent a lot of time doing that other than just collecting, collecting coins. And then, uh, and finally, you know, just in the past 10 to 15 years, as my brother was saying, uh, he was collecting, he was recollecting the 1794s through my brother. So my brother was paying for it. But he was going to get the coins. And, uh, you know, as he said, he, he, he called up. He would call up and say, we got to go to, we got to go to this, we got to go to this sale, we got to go to this auction and get this coin and whatever the cost. I, I didn't have to pay for it. So, uh, and, and, but he was, especially, I was always interested in 1794s from the time I was young. So I also, he started buying me, you know, just in the past 20 years as gifts. Uh, 1794 is not quite the, the kind of the expensive ones, but uh, we have a decent collection still. So um, I don't know if there's anything else I can say. I just uh, thank you again, and um, I really appreciate uh, your honoring my dad. And um, I know, and if you really know my dad, he'd be very upset that you were actually paying this much attention to him because he's, <laughs> he didn't like talking about himself. But thank you very much. This is great. I, I have to say that uh, neither Uda nor I were sure exactly how this was going to go. Um, and uh, and uh, David, you can report back to her that it went really well. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank uh, David and Dennis and, and Gary and Larry for speaking and for 
for, for saying the right things and for speaking the right way about a, a person that we all uh, have great esteem for and love for. And, and uh, I want to say again, there's still food and there's still free beer and free wine for a little while. When the free stuff is gone, they'll tell you, you can, and you can start to pay. But uh, the idea was for everybody to have a good time tonight, to honor uh, a very important person in the history of EAC. And uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>